Hello, how are you doing? It's another beautiful day. My name is Keith and um, I'm so delighted today to speak to you about the seven feasts of Israel. Uh, many people have always wondered what exactly about the feast of Israel? How come they're so significant and why did even God give them anyway? You see many people only hear, you know, the day of Pentecost, the time of the Passover, and they really ask themselves, what are all these things? What is the Passover? What is the Pentecost? What is the unleavened bread? What's all this and this? And uh, I today want to dissect the same so that people can be able to understand what are these seven feasts of Israel and how significant are they right now to us? You see, people only think they are for Israel. But in, in true fact, they also apply so much to us today. And uh, by the end of this uh, teaching, you'll be able to understand quite a number of things that you've never known about these seven feasts of Israel and also how important they are to us and what they signify, both what happened and what is also to happen in the days ahead. So I, I, I wish, if possible, you can stay with me all through the end. I know it's rather a very complicated topic, but I'll try to be as simple as possible so that you can be able to understand much more easier. And uh, we will sp uh, start by uh, Leviticus 23, verse 2, where the Bible says, Leviticus 23, 2, the Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. All right. So God says, these are my feasts. Okay. So they are the feasts of the Lord. Feasts. Feasts of the Lord. All right. So these are feasts of the Lord. So these are not feasts that, that uh, Moses came up with and then he told people celebrate this. No, it is the, they are feasts of the Lord. And they are also holy convocations. Holy con. Convocations. So convocation, a convocation is literally a calling. Alright? So they are holy callings. You're called to do something. Okay? So having known that, uh, we understand that God ordered these feasts to be kept for a reason. Mostly a future reason. This time, when these feasts were given, it was in the time of the Old Testament, the time of the Lord, the old, old days. And... Uh, it was a bit difficult for these people to really understand why are we being told to keep these feasts, okay? Uh, these feasts, they are for a season. They are for a certain season. They want to show us how things will progress maybe in a certain time. And we can see this in Leviticus 23, 4. It says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations which you shall proclaim in their seasons, okay? So we have seasons here. All right? So there are seasons that we are going to proclaim these holy convocations or these feasts for a certain season. And we can also check Leviticus 23, 44. The Bible says, And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. Again, the feasts of the Lord. Still insisting that they are not anyone else's feasts, but they are the feasts of the Lord. So all these feasts line up with the moon. They are all lining up with the moon. Uh, the first day being the new moon, all right? So we, we have the new moon, that is the new month, and then as we go down, we see differences. We see a certain feast here, a certain feast here, a certain feast here. They are all seven feasts. There's a, one extra feast which is uh, talked about, which is called the Feast of Hanukkah, but I will not speak about that. That one really doesn't, uh, is not spoken in the Old Testament. So I'll only stick with the seven feasts, all right? So now, what, what was there a reason to watch the moon in Israel? Because we see all these feasts, they line up with the moon, the way the moon goes. Is there a reason to watch the moon? Is, is the moon of any importance? Is the moon of any importance? In First Chronicles 23, 31, the Bible says, and to offer all burnt sacrifices unto the Lord in the Sabbaths, in the new moons, all right, and on the set feasts by number, according to the order commanded unto them, continually before the Lord. 
So you see, so there is an order, order which comes understanding the moon, all right? So the moon is quite important in this. Let's also see how, why God re really just made the moon. Why, why did God make the moon? Because we see the moon is quite important in understanding the feasts. So it means God did not just set the moon there up on the sky for no reason. Like just to, you see, the moon and the stars and all that, people wonder, why do we have stars in the sky? Why do we have all these kind of things? Why do we have the moon? But the Bible tells us why we have the moon. In Genesis 1, 14 to 16, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. All right? And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So the Bible is saying the moon and the stars and all that, they are for signs and for seasons. Okay? And for days and for years. Verse 15, and let them be for lights in the firmament uh, of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made the stars, okay? So now we already see that the moon and the stars and, the, and all that, they were for seasons to understand the days and years and seasons. So these feasts that God gave are an ordinance forever. So they are forever, all right? Ordinance, ordinance forever, all right? So they are not just for a certain time, but they will be over and over and over all the time of humanity, okay? In 2 Chronicles 2, 4, Behold, I build an house, to the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him and to burn before him sweet incense and for the continual shewbread and for the burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbath and on the new moons and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. So this, these feasts, they are ordinance forever to Israel. Okay? To Israel, So there's something that Israel has to understand using this feast. But then we see Israel affects the whole world. Israel affects every human being on the planet. And that's why even today we are seeing so many things happening and everybody's watching Israel. All these peace treaties, all these things which are happening. Every, every agreement with Israel affects the whole world because Israel affects every human being, whether you're Christian or you're not. Israel affects you because it's a, it's a chosen people of God. Those are the Jews who are chosen by God and they affect. Why? Because Abraham was told, through you, the whole world, all nations will be blessed through you. So Israel are Jews. They are children of Abraham. And through them, everyone in the world will be blessed. So we have to watch Israel. So if they have some feasts here which are affecting them, they're also affecting us as the Gentiles. So all these feasts are celebrated in different specific days after the start of the new moon every year. And they follow a strict laid out lunar calendar. So these feasts, they follow a lunar calendar. We see for us as the Gentiles, we don't, we don't follow the lunar calendar. We follow a solar calendar. We follow the sun, you know, our days are counted as by the sun, but then they count from the moon, okay? That, that's a difference, a big, huge difference between the Jews and, uh, and the Gentiles. So now, let me get down to these feasts and we'll be able to understand what do they involve. So we'll start with the first uh, four feasts, which are called the spring feasts. We will start with the spring, spring feasts. All right, or they also call the, the the spring feast, which happen in the month month of Nisan. All right, so the, we we'll start with the, those feasts, the spring feasts, which happen in the month of Nisan. So the first feast is called the feast of Passover. All right, the feast of Passover. So the Feast of Passover, I'm sure most of you have heard about this. So this feast starts exactly 14 days after the new moon, all right? 
exactly 14 days after the new moon. So I will write here, this is a 14 days after new moon. New uh, moon. All right. Now, having understood that, we can read this. And it happens for only one day. Leviticus 23, 5, the Bible says, In the 14th day of the first month, at even is the Lord's Passover. In the 14th day of the first month, at even is the Lord's Passover. So this Passover reminds the Israelites of how God delivered them from Egypt. That is the 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 the, the um, the understanding that they have, that it reminds them of how God, did, God delivered them from Egypt. But then later on, we will see also how it corresponds to today's life, how this feast of Passover corresponds to Jesus, because everything, all these feasts, they are feasts of the Lord. Like we understood, who is the Lord? Lord is Jesus Christ. So these are feasts which will correspond to Jesus. So, Initially, they used to celebrate them because they, they can remember how they came out from Egypt. Let's see, Numbers 9.5, it says, And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month, at even in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. So God commanded Moses to, for all of them, to keep the Passover. So they were commanded to do so by Moses. So that's the first feast that we see, 14 days after new moon, for only one day. Then now we see the other feast, which is called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Okay? Unleavened Bread. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread. So Unleavened Bread. Now this feast follows the Feast of Passover on the 15th day after the new moon or uh, the new month, and it goes for seven days. So this feast goes for about seven days, all right? Seven days. So it goes for seven days. This one goes for one day, all right? So this one is on the 15th day, 15th of the month. All right, new moon or new month, okay? 15th of the new moon or the new month, okay? So unleavened bread. Let's let's read that. In Exodus 12, 17 to 20, the Bible says, And you shall observe the feasts of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month of the 14th day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and 20th day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that, eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened, in all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. So we see, we are told, these people have to eat unleavened bread on, from the 15th of the, of the new moon or the new month. This one is on the 14th, so it is only 24 hours. Within 24 hours, you move from the Passover then to unleavened bread, okay? So having understood that, let's go to the third feast, which is called the Feast of Fast Fruits. All right? Fast fruits. So the feast of the fast fruits. Now fast fruits, in Exodus 23, 16 to 17, it tells us this. And the feast of harvest, the fast fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the fields, three times a year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord. So it's talking about this feast. It is saying it will happen. Uh, the feast of harvest, the first fruit of the labors which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of the ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered thy labors out of the field. 
Now, this one will be at the end of the year after you have done all your farming. You see, Israel was a, an agricultural society, so they used to do a lot of farming. So after you do all the farming, at around a certain time after you've done the... Uh, you have harvested, then now you could bring the first fruits, okay? First fruits to God. So we see this one used to happen after. This one is after the end of the year. All right? After harvest. Okay? So these are after the end of the year, after the harvest. So we have that first fruits okay now let's keep on checking so this feast is marked by the season of harvest after the year is done and harvest time has just started so that's that's a clear picture of what it's all about and then after that we see the feast of pentecost the feast of pentecost Okay, the Feast of Pentecost. So the Feast of Pentecost, let's see what it entails. This is um, 50 days after Passover. After this Passover, the Feast of Pentecost happens. That is 50 days after Passover. So this one happens 50 days after the Passover. And we can confirm that Leviticus 23, 16, the Bible says, Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So this one is offered by new meat. New meat. All right. Mark those words. New meat. And here is the first fruits, harvest, unleavened bread. This one is uh, no leaven. No living. No living. Living is a. Uh, have you ever eaten bread without living? Living is uh, that that thing which makes bread to be sweet, but then it's like uh, some kind of corruption. Is like you put something on the on the flour that makes it different, and then it's easier to be spoiled much more faster. But then it becomes more sweet. So no living. This is the time that you can eat. The bread without leaven, okay? So that's very, very important to understand. And you have to keep in mind that word, no leaven. We will check about that later on. So Passover here, also we understand that in the time of Passover, uh, they had to, uh, let me just check this just a minute. There's something I forgot to tell you about, uh, about Passover. Mm-hmm. Just a second, let me confirm this. Yes, now in this time of Passover, we understand what happened here. There had to be blood. Uh, sorry, uh, a lamb. A lamb killed. And the blood of the lamb had to be shed. Okay, so we understand about that. So keep that one in mind. So now having understood that, let's come to the other, uh, to the other feasts. Let me kindly, let me rub here. I think I need to get a bigger board because this one is a bit small. So we come to the other uh, feast, which is the, just divide here, which is the fall feasts, okay? Fall, uh -huh. fall feasts, fall feasts. This one are in the month of, the month of Tshirei. All right. The month of, the month of Tshirei. Okay, that's, that's what it's called. Eh? So now we see the fifth feast is called the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. So this is another different month. Okay, this is the first feast, which are the spring feast. And then we have the fall feasts which start on another month, okay, this is a different month, this is a different month. I want you to mark those uh, differences there. So now, in the Feast of Trumpets, it happens the first day of the seventh month. The first day, first day of seventh month. 
uh, in our calendar, that's around September, that's around September 18th, 19th, somewhere there. All right, in our in our solar calendar. So now the feast of trumpets. Let's let's read about this. Leviticus 23, 24, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. So this one is signified by blowing. Blowing of trumpets. All right? Blowing of trumpets. A holy convocation. Convocation is a holy calling. Holy calling. All right? Now, mark those words. Then, after that, we see another one called the Feast of Atonement. The Feast of Atonement. Atonement. All right. So the Feast of Atonement happens about 10 days after the Feast of Trumpet. Okay? Feast of Trumpet, then 10 days later, we see the Feast of Atonement happening. So this one is 10 days. 10 days after Feast of Trumpet. All right. Let me just read like that. So it's 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets, okay? So now that one you have to understand. So let's, let's read about this. So Leviticus 23, 27, it says, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this is a time that is signified by afflicting afflicting yourselves afflicting yourselves and then we are told something else apart from afflicting yourself and offering offering by fire by fire by fire let me just write like that. So there is afflicting yourselves and offering by fire. So we have to understand those, those uh, stuff there. Let me, I don't know if I can differentiate this. Okay. Uh, it's good to differentiate this. I know I don't have a bigger board, but pray for me. I'll get another bigger board. So atonement, 10 days, which is, involves afflicting yourself and offering by fire. All right. Let's see, the last feast is called the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles 7, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is 15 days from the Feast of Trumpet. The Feast of Trumpet is in the new month of Shirei, okay? So now we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is 15 days, which is uh, 15 days, 15 days after uh -huh, after trumpet after the feast of trumpet okay so that is 15 days after the feast of trumpet okay so now let's read about that leviticus 23:34 it says speak unto the children of israel saying the 15th day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So this one will happen seven days, okay? So now, having understood that, we already understand here that we have the feast of uh, Passover, unleavened bread, fast fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles, okay? So now, what's so special about these feasts? Is there something so special about these feasts that we need to know? Why did God give all these feasts? These feasts, as we understand, they align perfectly with the gestation period of a woman. They align very well with the gestation period of a woman, which is 280 days. 280 days. That's something you have to put in mind. So... If you see from the, these feasts, the, the, the Passover, all the way to Tabernacles and back again here, it is exactly 280 days. 
It gives us the whole plan of how probably would God be trying to show us something out of this because we understand these feasts, they is like they are lining to something. And if you count the days very, very well, it is about roughly 280 days plus minus something, but mostly plus maybe two or three or four days later, uh, more. Uh, now, is this trying to tell us something? I'm saying plus minus because there are some other feasts, like the Feast of Trumpet, it happens, it can happen on 18th, it can happen on 19th, because it's told us that the new moon, this new moon, you cannot know exactly which day. Nobody really knows the day or the hour of this, the feasts, okay? Could even also, probably, could God be... Have tell, could have been telling us something, especially on this feast. Did you, do you remember that verse which says, no one knows the day or the hour of his coming? Could he be saying he will come at a day that no one knows the day or the hour? I don't know. Maybe that could have been. Maybe, maybe not. Because if we see very well, this day of Feast of Trumpets, it's usually two long days. It's like two long days because it's the beginning of the moon. So you, you don't really understand if the moon will, will show up today or will show up tomorrow. So that's usually two long days. And they are called the day that no one knows the day or the hour in Israel. Just go and do your research and you'll be like, wow, what's all this? Now, having said that, having said that, we understand a couple of things. If a child is supposed to be born in 280 days, does it mean that all these feasts are trying to show us that a certain child will be born, a certain person will be born all through this, and this is trying to signify the time and the seasons before that child is born? Remember something here. Remember in Genesis, God promised a seed. He promised a seed to come who will rule the earth with a rod of iron. He said that there is a promised seed which will come later on. Could this be a certain way to try and tell us the seed one day will come? Who will, who will do something? Let, let, let's just read that. Genesis 3.15. The Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and shall bruise their head, and you shall bruise his heel. <laughs> so, are, are, are we being told about this Seed who will come to bruise and, of course, rule with the rod of iron. Are we talking about that? Could the Bible be talking about this seed? All right. So all these feasts line up with Jesus Christ and what he did and what he will also do in the future. That's something we have to understand. So this, like we read, they are feasts of the Lord. So let's get deep and understand this feast in depth and see what exactly do they entail. And how do they go with Jesus Christ? All right? So the first feast, Passover. Let's see. We saw it in the Old Testament. How does it entail now in the New Testament? How can we be able to say, okay, this one is talking about this in the New Testament? In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Bible says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lamp, as you are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. So now we are told Jesus is our Passover. So now if Jesus is our Passover, what does that tell us? That Jesus actually fulfilled this on the feast of Passover. Jesus himself, we know he was killed on the day of Passover. He was crucified, sorry, on the day of Passover. That's the time that he was dying. So now when we see this and we are told that Jesus... Christ is our Passover, then it means Jesus is the New Testament Passover lamb. Before the Old Testament Passover lamb, there had to be a lamb which had to be killed. Now Jesus fulfills this. All right? Let's see what really happened in the, in the Old Testament, how they actually did this Passover. Let's see, so that we can understand. Exodus 12, 3 to 7, it says, Speak ye unto all congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take up to them every man a lamb according to the house of their father. A lamb for a house. So there had to be a lamb. Verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it 
according to the number of the souls, every man according to the eat, to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb should be without blemish. Mm-hmm. The lamb should be without blemish. Mark that one. A male of the first year. So it has to be a male of the first year. And you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. So the lamb will be kept 14 days. All right. So could it be meaning that this Passover 14 has a certain significance. We'll be kept 14 days of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now, understand something here. The significance of this Passover, we first understand that everything that has been spoken here happened to Jesus. So Jesus, uh, in 14 days, the lamp was kept and killed, all right? He was killed on the 14 days. That is on the feast of Passover. The lamp should be without blemish. Uh-huh. And then they have to take out the blood. The blood of Jesus was taken out. It was shed on that day. And then it has to be stricken on the two sides of the door. So you have to strike. You have to put the blood. Listen to verse 7. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper post of the house wherein they shall eat it. So it's saying that this one, let's, let's say this is the door. This is the door. It has to be put here and here and here. <laughs> Are you seeing something? Are you seeing something uh, funny here? Strike it on the two sides of the door post. One on the upper door posts and two on the sides. So upper, does this not seem like the cross of Jesus Christ? Exactly what happened to him? Is it not this looking like the cross of Jesus Christ? Are you seeing something? So Jesus himself fulfilled this. So Jesus fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled these feasts. So having known that, we have already understood the significance of that Passover. And the significance of what they were celebrating Passover all through, it could happen later. And Jesus fulfilled that. Now, let's see the unleavened bread. Did Jesus also fulfill this? Is there a way that we can understand? John 6.35, it says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. Jesus is talking about bread here. And we know Jesus is sinless. So this bread is no living. There is no living. So there is no corruption. So does it mean that Jesus being the bread of life, his body was the bread? His body was the bread? And we see also in Acts 13, 37, it says, but he whom also God raised saw no corruption. <laughs> so God raised a person who had no corruption, who was unleavened. So Jesus fulfilled this by being unleavened. He li- li- literally saying that Jesus was buried on the feast. On We understand that Jesus, the time that he was buried, it was during the time of the feast of the unleavened bread. So I tend to think that he became the unleavened bread here. So, if he was buried on this day, then he became the unleavened bread. He was sinless. We understand that he, was, he saw no corruption. So, if he saw no corruption, then it means it was unleavened. All right? And then, when you look at this, we understand also that Jesus fulfilled this. Jesus fulfilled these feasts. All right? So he became the unleavened bread for us. He became sinless. For He was the sinless person who took away our sins to the grave. So this is the day that Jesus was buried. This is the day that Jesus was killed, crucified on the cross. This is the day that Jesus was buried. And then let's see about the first fruits. Is there anything which talks about Jesus and the first fruits? Is there something that we can say, okay, now Jesus and the first fruits. Let's see. In 1 Corinthians 15:20 the Bible says but now is Christ risen from the dead and be 
and become the first fruits of them that slept. <laughs> Do you understand something? Jesus was, was uh, he, he rose on the feast of first fruits. And uh, having seen this, it also tells us something here that Christ has become the, the, the first fruits of them that slept. So he fulfilled this also by becoming the first fruits. Let's see, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So Jesus himself was resurrected at the, at the feast of first fruit. Was there any significance by this? Jesus fulfilled the same. All right. So let's see, how did they actually celebrate this feast in the Old Testament? So that we can see, did he really fulfill it in a way or not? Or is there another different way or something? Let, let's just see, how did they celebrate in the Old Testament this feast of first fruits? Leviticus 23, 10 to 12. The Bible says, speak, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you become into the land which I give unto you, you shall reap the harvest therefore, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So they shall harvest and they come with all their first fruits. And then they will, the priest will take a sheaf. Listen, verse 11. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. He shall say, hey, this is... This is all that people have done. He will wave the sheep, just one, one piece of the, 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 the things which have been brought, the first fruits. To be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when the and uh, when the wave of when you wave the sheep uh, and he lamb without a blemish of the first year. For a burnt offering unto the Lord. So the we the sheaf will be waved, and then God will accept your first fruits. So does it mean, let's see at the significance. Jesus was the first fruit. Does it mean that when he went up, he went and uh, he presented himself as now? These people, we need people to come to heaven. But now there has to be a first fruit to show that hey. I have done this. This is the first harvest from the dead. So that other people also will also be harvested at his own time. So people gave first fruits. The priest took a sheep and waved it unto the Lord. Jesus died at the cross. And the Bible tells us that God was satisfied with him. So God, when Jesus died, he was satisfied. Does it mean that that is the same satisfaction that they used to do? Was it significant to this? When Jesus rose, he took his blood to the mercy seat of heaven. The same way they used to take that sheaf and try to wave it to God. We see Jesus himself, when he, when he rose, he took his own blood to the mercy seat in heaven. We can read that in Hebrews 9.12. Hebrews 9.12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So he went himself and took his own blood to the holy place in heaven at the mercy seat. So Jesus also fulfilled this feast. Jesus fulfilled. So we see already that feast has been fulfilled. Let's see. What about the Feast of Pentecost? Was it fulfilled? Is there a way that we can say now this feast was fulfilled? Or is it a future feast? Let's see. Let's see about this feast. In Acts 2, 1 to 4, Acts 2, 1 to 4, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a right, rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. So this feast was fulfilled by the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit entered into the body of Christ. So these people were the people who are sitting down there. They are waiting for this. They are saved people. 
What happened? In the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit got in. You remember? Before, it used to be a new meat. This Pentecost was signified by burning or, I mean, sacrifice of a, of a new meat. But now, this new meat is the new body of Christ. All right? That is the people, the saved people. So the Holy Spirit got inside the saved people. There were about 120 people. All right? So in the Old Testament, it was signified by new meat offering unto the Lord. But now, it's not an animal, but now it's getting into the body of brethren. So we see this one is fulfilled by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit fulfilled. So these spring feasts have already been fulfilled. We see they have been fulfilled all through Passover, Unleavened Bread, Fast Fruit, and Pentecost in the month of Nisan. Now let's see about these other feasts, which is the Feast of Trumpet, Atonement, and Tabernacles. Have they been fulfilled or are they future feasts? Now let's see this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52, the Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. So Paul is saying, I'm showing you a mystery. Not all of us will die, but we shall be changed. Listen, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. Wow. So now he's talking about some trumpet which will sound is a mystery, something which has not been known over the years. So in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about a holy convocation, a holy calling. Like I told you, a holy calling. This will be a holy convocation, the blowing of trumpets. So why are you being called? Being called. Is there something significant? Let's see how, they, they, how that verse explains. Let's just reread the verse again. Leviticus 23, 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, comma, a holy convocation, holy calling. So, somebody can ask, how, how are the trumpets blown in Israel during these feasts? Now, they usually, um, the blowing of the feast eh, or of the trumpets in Israel happens in a very, very unique way. You just don't blow up ooh, all those trumpets. No, it is blown in a sequence. Now, it is blown in a specific way to make all the blows 33. So there is a, I think there's one blow, uh, pop, and then pop, 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 and then pop, pop, pop. I, I don't know how they do it, but they are 33 blows. Then those 33 blows, they are blown in a set of three. So it is 33. And then after that, you repeat again the 33, and then you repeat again the 33. That one gives you what? It gives you 99 blows. But then, after the 99 blows, there's one final blow, which is blown very long one. It can be blown for as long as your breath can hold. The longest one, which they name it the last trump. So there are 99 blows, but then there's the last trump, which is blown. Could Jesus have been setting this for a future time frame to show us the day of the rapture? Could it be possible? I'm not saying it is, but it somehow sounds like that. Because if we are told, look, look at that verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, <laughs> We have 99 and then we have one longer trumpet. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So does it mean that this last trump is very significant? It may be that trumpet. And remember, the Bible also tells us, Jesus was asked, when, when will you come? He said, that day no man knows the day or the hour. And like I told you, this is a day that you cannot tell it will start on this day or this day. Because it's the beginning of the new moon. Unless the moon shows up today or tomorrow, you can't tell which day it is. It may be today or tomorrow. Could that be also another clue of the day of the rapture? So this one seems, 
seems, I'll just say seems, the day of the rapture. So this one seems to be the day of the rapture. So I'm just, I'll just put a question mark. I don't want to be told I'm a dead satyr. No, I'm not setting any date. I'm not setting anything. But the Bible tells us in Revelation 3.3, 3, if, if you will not watch, therefore you will not know when the day of the Son of Man is going to come. So what's the opposite of that? If you will watch, you will know. So are you getting the difference? So are you seeing? This one seems to be a future feast. Now let's see the other one, which is the Feast of Atonement. The Feast of Atonement. Is there anything significant about the Feast of Atonement? Is, has it been fulfilled or is it going to be fulfilled ahead? Revelation 11.1 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. And the altar and them that worship therein. So now there will be people worshipping in the altar. What will they be doing in the altar? And where will this altar be? We understand this one is talking about the altar which will be in Jerusalem. And uh, Israelites, the Jews, will be there celebrating and trying to... Let me add some light here. Okay, yeah, at least you can see me better. All right. Now, we are told about this celebration which will be there. Could it be meaning about that time when the Israelites will have gotten back in their temple and at the middle of that time when they are doing that sacrifice then the Antichrist kicks them out? Because that day, the day that they'll be, you know, uh, doing the sacrifice, the one that is uh, spoken by Prophet Daniel, the desolation, the, 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 the abomination of desolation. That time when Israelites will be kicked out and they'll be afflicted. Did, did we read something about afflicting? Did he really talk about afflicting and offering by fire? Now, let's see something here. I think this is the time that Israel has to go through tribulation. Therefore, Jesus comes again and he will save them from that. He will, you know, he'll tell them, go and hide yourself there. And then he'll come and hide yourself in the mountain. Flee to the mountains if you're in Judea. So they will offer sacrifice at the temple, but be kicked out or afflicted by the Antichrist. Let's read Jeremiah 37. It says, Jeremiah 37, it says, Alas! For that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So this seems to be that time when Jacob, who is Jacob? Jacob is Israel. Jacob is the children of Abraham. That is the Jews, the Israelites, the 12 tribes. So they'll be afflicted. They'll be checked, ch chased out. They'll be afflicted. It will be a time of trouble. All right, Jacob's. So if it's the time of Jacob trouble, and we understand very well this feast, most probably it will happen that the Feast of Atonement, that celebration, the time that they'll be trying to do the, that abomination of desolation, most probably it will be that time. Let's see something here. How did the Israelites celebrate the Feast of Atonement before? How about they, they always celebrated? We see in Leviticus 23, 27 to 32, it says, Also the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. A day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you. So people will be called together in one place. And you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Why, why is God telling people to afflict them, themselves? Well, what's the significance? Verse 28, And you shall... And you, sh and you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it shall be, that it shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. So we are told any person who will not be afflicted on that day, he will be cut off. Now let's see this, verse 30. And whatsoever soul... It be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict again. Afflict, have trouble. 
Mm-hmm. Afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even from even unto even you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So what's the significance of this? This one most probably will be fulfilled at the third temple when Israel will be kicked out while sacrificing to God. So it is a holy convocation, a holy calling. They will come together, the, all the Jews. When Jesus returns, remember, they will also be called after they have been kicked out and now they are in the bush and they are crying and asking, oh Jesus, please help me. Now they have realized that this guy who was pretending to be the Messiah is actually a fake and that's the time now they will realize, whoops, we had the wrong Messiah. And that's the time that now Jesus will come and the Bible says, and all Israel will be saved. He will save them. He will save them. And then he will call them from all corners. There's a verse even talking about this, how he will call. He will send all angels all over to go and pick the Israelites, the elect. Let's see, Matthew 24, 31. He says, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. So the, the elect, the Israelites will be gathered. So this one seems it will be fulfilled at the third temple. Seems. This one seems uh, at third temple. I'm not, I'm not giving you an exact thing. I'm just telling you it seems to be at the third temple according to how we understand. So I'm not a date setter. I'm not uh, setting any date, but I'm only showing you. So let's see. The Feast of Tabernacles. Is there any significance? Is it a future or has it happened? This feast. These ones we can confirm 100% they have been fulfilled. What about this? Tabernacles. Matthew 17, 1 to 4. The Bible says, and after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up to a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. So Jesus goes with uh, the three up to a high place in the mountain and then he's transfigured. And his faith, face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking to, with him. Then answered Peter, Peter is always talking, he's always saying something. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So why was Peter thinking about let's make some tabernacles? It means they have always, you know, because they were always accustomed to making some booths in preparation. It's like you make some booths, some, some places of, it's like you want to be together to worship. It's like a tabernacle, it's like an altar. You're making some booths. Before, we have seen this happening. Because the main tabernacle, it, I think these booths and these small, small things that they were making, I will read for you this one in just a minute. It was like a preparation of how they will worship God together in one altar, in one tabernacle together, worshiping Jesus when he is there. Because when Peter and the other guys saw Moses and Elijah and Jesus there, maybe they could have thought, and Jesus is now glorified, he is being, he's shining like light. Maybe they thought this is it. Now this is the time. Can we make some tabernacle and then start worshipping you now? Or can we do it later? And then he suggested. But then Jesus uh, had a different idea. Now let's see. What really happened back in the days about this tabernacle when they were doing the Feast of Tabernacle? What really happened? Leviticus 23, 41 to 43 says, And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths. Listen, you shall dwell in booths. Seven days. All that are Israelites born shall, be, shall dwell in booths. So everyone who is born Israelite will have to dwell in booths. It's like you're, you're, you're entering in something. It's like you're trying to imply something which will come in the future. Verse 43, that your generations may know that I am, I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths after I brought them from the land of Egypt. So it's like 
This is a perfect place. Now you can dwell here. This is a promised thing. This is a promised land. This is a promised everything. And you dwell in that. Could God have been showing something? We also see in Leviticus 23, 36, it says, Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. So these people are, will assemble together, and you shall do no service work therein. So this is a solemn assembly. We see solemn, uh, solemn assembly. This seems to be a future time when Jesus will be here. I think the significance is it will be fulfilled during the millennial kingdom. People will assemble together from all places in the world and they will come and worship Jesus at the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. All right? So people will gather together in all that. So I think this is a future feast. This is something that people will come together and the, all the time this one was all about booths. Making of booths. Booths literally meaning is like you want to be together in one place. So mostly this one seems, this is the, this seems to be future. Seems future at David's throne. In Jerusalem. Where Jesus will be ruling. All right. Let me just write like that. So this one seems to be a future at David's throne where Jesus will be ruling. Do you know the name Jesus means what? Jehovah rules. Jehovah rules and he will rule in Jerusalem. So I hope you have understood something. I hope it has been of great impact to you. The seven feasts of Israel. I hope you can be able to learn something and you will be able to understand these seven feasts are really, really important to all of us. They mean a lot. And the, the first feasts, we understand they've been fulfilled. But this one soon, they're also coming. So understand that. And you can always talk to other people so that they may also be able to learn. Kindly share the message. God bless you. And have a great, great time.